Hello, everyone. Uh, this is indeed uh, the Bible study you are looking for. I am Pastor Aaron Fenker. I am filling in for Pastor Borkhart. So we are going to just wait here and uh, we're going to wait and see uh, who shows up. And, uh, well, hello, uh, Terry Lynn. Hello, Will. This is great. People are showing up. I'm here. You're here. We're all in this together. And if I do things right, maybe I won't have to do this again. Or I'll just kick Pastor Borgard to the curb. Just kidding. No, that neither of those things will happen. Um, uh, boy, oh my goodness. Everyone's saying hi. Uh, this is a uh, not my workspace. Uh, I'm co-opting uh, my wife's uh, sewing area and a guest bedroom because it's, well, it's the only place we've got good internet in the house. And uh, yeah, here we are together. So we'll wait a few more minutes because I know that there's about a 45 second delay in, uh, in streaming. So I'm going to get a drink of water here. And uh, oh, so many people are here. This is great. And I, um, again, for you just showing up, I'm Pastor Aaron Fenker. I do not have a cute dog. Um, we'll see. Um, it's possible, though they've been told to sort of not barge in here, that one of my three children will, who are mobile, I have four, uh, one of the three who are mobile will come busting in here because they'll, they'll distract, they'll, they'll plan and plot in order to do things. Um, we'll see if that happens. It would be entertaining. Um, so uh, we are in Colossians, and uh, it's been a couple minutes, and uh, we are just um, going to keep keep going through the text here. I was told where to where Pastor Borkhart left off in chapter two, um, and so we are starting in um, Thor. Oh, Thor is still here, man. Ugh, okay, well we'll just. I don't know what happened to dad. He's missing. Can't you find him? Can't you, can't you smell? Can't you smell him out? Anyway, uh, we will be in Colossians. Gene wants to know, do I, do I have an HT mug? I do, but it's, it's not the time of day where I am, uh, drinking coffee. So, uh, here I am in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, where I'm drinking my, uh, country water out of a Mason jar. That's all you got today. And it is water. Otherwise, well, that would make for a very interesting Bible study, and that's not what that's not what we're about here in Higher Things. So, let's get to the text before I ramble and enjoy myself talking about nothing. So, we are in Colossians 2, in verse 8. Um, I'll just keep reading here. See to it, watch out, um, keep a lookout, um, so that no one becomes your no captor uh, comes for you, right? So that there will be no one who takes you captive. That's what's, it's, a, it's an odd construction. Uh, kind of smooths it out. Um, see that no one takes you captive. But it's more, um, Paul's putting it in terms of he's got um, someone in mind who's going to come to get you. Um, and watch out for him. Watch out for that one who's going to come and get you. Uh, and how is that, that, that captor um, going to take you captive? To, to pull you out of the freedom you have in Christ Jesus, because that's what's going on here. Uh, you've been baptized into Christ Jesus. Um, as Paul would say in Galatians, um, for freedom Christ has set you free. But now here comes um, this captor who's going to come and get you. And he's going to come and get you uh, with philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, the tradition of man, um, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So Christ sets you free and anything that isn't Christ, um, well, isn't free. So Jesus is the one who sets free. So anyone who is not Christ or of Christ, uh, is going to be someone who's going to cap capture you again to take you captive. Um, to take you um, back into the, the domain of darkness, 
uh, which is um, the, the beginning of this book. And according to the elemental spirits, uh, okay, um, it's more like the, uh, the fundamental principles of, of life. And elemental spirits, I mean, okay, that's, it's, it's true that our warfare in this life um, is not against flesh and blood per se. Um, it's not against, this is Ephesians. Uh, our fight isn't with, you know, like in Paul's day, he's not fighting against Rome or the emperor. Um, that there's a, a spiritual reality behind that which is true. So the devil is always working um, in order to take us away from Jesus. That's really what he wants. Um, uh, but it's more like the fundamental, what, what are the fundamentals of the world? What's the fundamental philosophy? What's the fundamental lie? That's what's going on here. What's the fundamentals? What does the world teach you? Um, there's different fundamentals, different schools of thought. Um, one Paul deals with a lot would be um, would be uh, sort of hedon, what's called hedonism, just living for pleasure, um, living for self, right? Very, very right, Terry Lynn. Very good. Um, yeah, living for self, living for pleasure, not for your neighbor. Um, but there would be other elemental principles, you know, that there would be philosophies that would be uh, geared towards the neighbor. Uh, there would be Stoic philosophies too. But all of those things, um, yeah, you can become great, right? Um, that's what they do. But Christ comes um, to set you free. He's the freedom giver. And he's much more, um, hmm, much bigger than any sort of worldly philosophy. For verse 9, for in him the fullness of the deity dwells bodily, somaticos, fleshly, uh, bodily. Um, that is, uh, Paul's getting real here. So that these philosophies, um, so hedonism actually denies the body because the body is for nothing other than pleasure, which is fleeting. Um, so Christ, the fullness of God, everything that is God is, is in Jesus. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're talking about the person, he's the person of the son. So that there's no, um, nothing of the son that is outside of Jesus, the flesh and blood Jesus that you can, that you could see and touch and hear. Um, Paul's in the same place that John is in his first epistle. And it's not just this abstract idea. Um, but in verse 10, Paul continues, and you are, uh, you have been filled up in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And so you don't have to worry about some sort of fundamental principles that people have to um, sort of think up on your own. Um, you have the creator of the universe on your side, the creator of the universe uh, becomes man for your sake. And he fills you up. He gives you all that you need, not just um, for this body and life, uh, but for the things that endure past this body and life. Um, well, not past this body, because that body will be raised from the dead. But you know what I, I hope you know what I mean, is that Jesus, the creator of the universe, fills you up. And you don't have to find after empty philosophies that at the end of the day don't satisfy. There's a reason there's a no end to self-help books because they don't satisfy. You reach the end of one thing and there's always more. And some philosophies would say that's just life is the pursuit of that, that next better. But at the end of the day, there's no resolution. There's none. There's no, it is finished with any of the philosophies of the world, but there is an, it is finished with Christ. He is uh, the root, the beginning of all things, and he brings all things to completion at his death to tell us die. It is finished, and then he he delivers you unto himself in eternal life. All right, let's keep going here. Um, in him you have also been circumcised 
uh, in a in a circumcision done without hands, in the stripping off of the body of flesh, in the circumcision of Christ, being uh, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised through raised through the 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 faithful working of God who raised him from the dead. So here is now, how does this all happen? How do you get rescued again out of this empty philosophy that weighs you down, that entraps you, that traps you not just um, to their principles, but traps you in your own flesh where you're either going to die um under the weight of, of pleasure or under the weight of just trying to get rid of it all yourself. Well, that doesn't happen with Christ. He does all for you. And so it makes sense if he's the, the ruler of all uh, authority and power uh, that he will, um, he will then deliver that to you. And he does it through this new circumcision, this new putting off of the flesh, the body of flesh of its, of its desires. Um, and what is that? How does that happen? And here again, this echoes um, the way Jesus talks in, um, in the end of Matthew 28, where there's this, there's a main idea in Matthew 20, which is make disciples. And how do you do that? Well, then that's described as baptizing uh, in, into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to cherish all that I've commanded you. So those two things, baptizing and teaching, describe how it is disciples are made. And so also here, Paul does this same thing. So you were circumcised. Well, how does that happen? And what sort of circumcision happens without hands? Um, and so that is described as being buried in, uh, being buried with Christ in baptism, uh, in the baptism. Um, so here Paul has in mind holy baptism, because there is only one. There's only one baptism where you are buried with Christ and your sinful flesh has been, been cut off and that you also are raised with him. So here Paul again um, is saying the same thing he says in um, Romans chapter 6. Um, just here in a more brief way. Romans 6 is a little bit longer. And... Um, you were raised through the, the, the faithful working of God uh, who raised him from the dead. So God is faithful to his promises. Uh, we can trust in his promises. We can have faith in his working. Um, and here this, um, we are raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. Um, it can either be, uh, it can be that, or it can be through his faithful working, through God's faithful working. Um, and which is it? Uh, I mean, faith has to have something to trust in, and your faith trusts in in baptism, where God is true to His promises uh, to cut off your 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 sinful flesh and to raise you in Christ, um, and that's what happens. Um, raise him from the dead. All right, continuing with Paul's thought here. Um, and you being um dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh um he made you alive together with him um forgiving being gracious uh to you uh all all the trespasses so um you were dead uh, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So um, Paul's language here is echoing Ephesians. So you didn't have, you, you were stuck. There was no way to get out of your problem. There was no way to get out of my problem. The, the human problem is such that no, no one can get out of it. And we try, we always try. Um, we try in the church. If, um, I'll try and, and, and stick Pastor Borkhart with Colossians 3 so he gets to dive into to sanctification. But, but often we'll even use sanctification as a means uh, of, of making up for our sins. 
Uh, we're always playing that game. I've done this sin, and so now I've do this other thing, um, this good thing, and that makes up for it. And maybe we'll we'll talk in terms of God being, you know, empowering us, but it still is up to us. And so it's it's the same thing, just another weight um, that weighs you down. Um, and uh, so you were dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that is living for self and pleasure. That's how you were. But even though you were that, being that existence, what does God do for you? Um, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses, having been gracious to all the trespasses towards us. It's, it's, uh, he's gifting us the forgiveness of sins. And we are made alive together with him. And we don't want to miss this. This is very important. Um, this is very similar language um, to John chapter 15, vine and branches. You're only alive with him. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Um, he is your life. Um, that is, that's coming up here in our, in our passage, that Christ is your life. He is um, your forgiveness. He is your life. He's the one who frees you. Apart from him, there's nothing. And it's, it's that yes or no with the Lord. Um, you're either in Christ or you're not. Um, and in Jesus, with Jesus, um, united with him, clothed with him uh, in baptism, you are alive. He makes you alive. And so um, he bears his fruit in and through you by the power of the Spirit working in and through you. Um, but that would be more John 15 here and not, and not Colossians 2. Um, but what Jesus says there and what Paul says here are, are the same. They're just using different language to do it. Um, and so, okay, forgiven all our trespasses. How does he do this? Another um, more, more um, what are these called? Participles defining what, what's going on here. By laying aside the record of debt, which was um, even um, which was against us, even if we even if we sin now as there's a question, uh, even if we sin now as Christians, I don't I don't fully that's a will you'll have to maybe write a clarifying question. I think I know what you're going with, but I want to make sure. I don't want to not answer your your question. Um, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, um, this he um, laid aside, uh, nailing it to the cross. So the hand, the the the, we are still in Christ. Uh, if we sin now as Christians, well, this would get to the heart of the simile that we are, when we are, who we are in Christ, uh, we are, we are completely made new, but yet we are, we still have the flesh and in the flesh, there is no good, uh, at all. And so the flesh will do what it is, what, what it wants. And the, the spirit, um, in our new man does what he wants, um, and we're sort of divided, and and when we, we're, we're trying to. You can certainly sin against your conscience. Do what's wrong, and you know it's wrong. And you can uh, forsake the spirit, and we have examples of this in the scriptures. Um, David does that. He sins against his own conscience. Uh, he not only um, goes with Bathsheba. Uh, then he, he, he tries to lie about it, tries to cover it up. Then he tries to, then he murders a guy. So David there has, um, has turned from faith. Uh, he is outside of Christ, outside of faith in Christ. Cause that's not to get completely down a rabbit trail. Uh, but, but David has the same faith you and I do. He had a faith in a savior who was not yet arrived. 
Um, and we have a Savior who has arrived and will come again. Um, and the Lord's judgment is, if we want to forsake him, he will let us have what we want. And then we are not in him. Um, but when we are in him, there is no condemnation. And so, yes, we sin. Um, but the idea of these sins against the Holy Spirit, of unbelief, of sinning against the conscience, they're the big ones. It's not it, the, the flesh and the spirit are just at war. We're the battleground. Um, we're pulled this way and that way. Um, we're a mess. We're a mess um, of flesh and, and spirit. And we're waiting for this body of death to be taken away. Um, the, the consequences and the judgment and the condemnation of our sins have been taken from us. And we're waiting for the day when we'll finally be redeemed from the source of the problem. That's what we're waiting for. And then we're waiting for the day. Um, uh, we are waiting for the day that um, that we will be raised from the dead, where we will have a, a, a spirit-filled body, uh, where we will delight in the law of God. Um, we will delight to do God's will uh, from a completely freed spirit um, in the in the eternal kingdom. Um, I hope that helps. The the symbol is a whole other. Um, uh, it's a big subject of debate today in in Lutheran circles. Um, so I'm not going to try and take the time to hash it all out here. Um, but part of our problem is we want our motivations to always be one or the other. Uh, because we're trying, I think part of our problem is we, we deal in psychological terms. We want a psychological unity. And, and the scriptures don't really talk that way. And, and they're not operating in that sort of worldview. So they're not trying to explain it in those terms. Um, but what we'll have is um, we might even be doing good. And are our motivations completely pure? Uh Probably not. The flesh is always there. We can't deny that. And yes, we are completely new. I don't know. You just kind of go back and forth. It's kind of hard to, to navigate in a clear-cut way. Anyway, I'm glad it was helpful. Let's keep going. Where are we? In the text. I don't know. 14? We'll just keep going. Um, oh, it's nailed to the cross. Oh, all the law there in Jesus nailed. Oh, the record of debt nailed to the cross. Because Jesus was nailed to the cross. He bore all the debt in himself. The eternal God bore the eternal consequences of everyone's sin in his own body. And there he was nailed. And with it, the condemnation that stood against you. All the condemnation that stood against you, that stood against me, that stood against everybody in the world who's ever lived and will live all nailed there in Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who shed his blood there and gave his life there so that we would be free. <sighs> nailed to the cross. And this is the other thing, too. In a world where we don't like, we don't like the law. We don't want the law to be the law um, in sanctification or just in how we, the world. The world wants no law. And they, they would say that God is judgmental or Christians are judgmental for preaching the law about whatever sin we happen to, to, to need to preach on according to our context. Um, you know, whether that's, um, you know, Fourth Commandment related, how do we relate to our civil authorities and the police? Or F Fifth Commandment, how do we deal with uh, murder? or abortion, or Sixth Commandment issues, um, uh, marriage, uh, divorce, um, gender things, um, or, or Seventh Commandment, stealing, all, all of down the commandments. We don't want to, some need more talking about than others. Um, but the, uh, it's all been nailed to the cross. There we go. Now I remember where I was going with that. I got lost in the law. That's never a good place to get lost. 
Um, huh, um, the world doesn't want that law because then it's like the world operates in this philosophy that here's this law and here's these things for your life that you've got to do. And if you do it right, well, there you go. God, you're on God's good side and he'll save you. And if you don't do them right, well, um, um, you're, you're in hell. And the world's operating where now God is on the defensive stand. Historically, um, as of about a few hundred years ago, everyone understood if God's God, he's judge. He calls the shots. Um, but now it's different. And so now the world is like, I would never believe in such a God who would say, who would, def who would define what love is um, in a way that I don't like. Because I've decided that love is love or whatever. Um, but all the commandments have to teach us what love is because we're now stupid because of the, the rebellion into sin. Um, we now need to be, God needs to tell us, this is what love looks like. It looks like honoring your parents. It looks like not killing people. It looks like not stealing or not coveting or not slandering. That's what love looks like. But this is what God does. So he sets up these things that are sins. And we think there's that philosophy that, oh, I've got to meet the standard or the, the, the mean judge upstairs is going to judge me. Well, I don't like that sort of God. But what does God do? God takes all, he sets up, these are all the things that are hell worthy. These are all the things that are worthy of my eternal judgment. And then he nails them to the cross in his son. That's what he does with that. He doesn't set up these 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 dogmas. That's the word here. Um, these demands, dogmas. He didn't set up dogmas or 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 rules and regulations to to sort of force you to to measure up. He he does them because we've rebelled against him, and his solution to that problem, his solution is, these are the sins, and you know what. All those dogmas about what's right and what's wrong and where you don't measure up, I'm going to nail them to my son. And he's going to shed his blood for them and die for them. God himself, he takes the judgment. And then, and then what he wants to do is to take all those, that flesh and that sin and cut it off from us and rescue us from it to set us free so that we aren't slaves to what we define as whatever we want to do, whether that's love or steal or marry whoever I want or divorce and get remarried 80 times. I don't know if somebody got, that would be a lot of times, but whatever. Or have people in the world marry objects or, or all the, whatever sin it is. It doesn't matter in what way we've transgressed the commandments. He, he wants to remove that from us. He wants to make us new. He wants us to live as he created us to be. Um, and part of his solution to that is nailing it all to Jesus so that you, it's not nailed to you. It's not credited to your account because it was accounted to Jesus' account. And Jesus was, was thrown under the bus by everybody, even his father. As uh, that's, that's Matthew, the book we just got out of. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right here, this is why. Every legal demand nailed through Jesus to the cross. Whew. All right. Clean slate. That's right, Grace. Clean slate. Let's see here. 215. He disarmed. Hmm. He stripped away the rulers and authorities and put them and he shamed them openly, triumphing over them in him, in Jesus. Triumphing th uh, three um, triumphal procession. And uh, this is the scandal of the cross. <laughs> um, because um, it's triumph in a way that we wouldn't view triumph. So how does he strip away rulers and authorities, putting them to shame, 
through the cross. That's where we just are. That's where we just finished it. Nailed to the cross. That's where he strips them away. He disarms them, takes away everything they've got. And they're shamed in his shame. And then he leads them in procession. That was a, an ancient world thing. So the victors, it'd be like um, if we had, you know, if we have pro sports and there's the um, uh, the Super Bowl parade, um, the Super Bowl parade would include whoever won uh, leading the losers through town so that they could be mocked by the winners. That's, that's what this is going on. That's what's going on here. Um, that, that's what's going on here. Um, and, and the thing we don't want to, to forget here is that this is all very focused on, on Christ on the cross. That's where it all happens. That's really everything. Jesus on the cross. Paul is driving us to that point again and again. And, and all the sort of abstract ideas about um, rulers and authorities and whatever um, they've got going on that's sort of abstract. Well, where is that concretely taken care of? In Christ. All right. And because, let's keep going. Um, therefore, let no do not let anyone condemn you in food. And in drink, or in um, parts, of, or in uh, regards, or, or how to deal, or, or plan of feasts, or new moons, or sabbaths. So you've really—that's how free you are. The elemental principles of the world are done in Jesus. And so then why would you let somebody judge you over what you're eating or drinking or whether you celebrate a new moon or some other festival or a Sabbath? Um, and uh, these things uh, are um, shadows of what's to come, but the, the body um, is of Christ, is Christ, the substance. Um so all those things were shadows of what was to come. Um, and that shadow is Christ. So whether it was whatever Old Testament feasts. So here he's, Paul's dealing with not just the, the fundamental principles of um, the pagan world, but the fundamentals of Judaism as well. For the Judaizers coming through and saying, well, you, you've got to do, um, you'll be circumcised. Well, here, you know, there's true circumcision. It's not you know, of the flesh, it's, it's baptism. Oh, well, you got to celebrate these feasts or new moons or Sabbaths. And Paul's like, no, none of that. Those fundamentals, even though they were revealed by God, are shadows. And what's casting the shadow? It's the body of Christ. That's what the body of Christ, um, the substance belongs to Christ. Um, I mean, you could take it that way. Um, I don't particularly like that definition. Um, this is going to be a nerd moment um, because um, I think uh, this is the this would be the fourth or fifth definition of the word in the dictionary. I looked it up. I was like, what kind of what are they trying to to, to play at here? Uh, kind of always we have to be aware of translators from time to time. Um, just not too often, but sometimes um, they're trying to understand as much as we are. Um, and so here, this uh, tasoma ta to Christu, the, the substance belongs to Christ, the body. That's what that word is. Um, and it says, well, this means uh, what's really true because this is talking about a shadow. Um, the problem is, this is the fourth definition of a word. And we don't really operate that way. I don't think anybody's ever operated that way. Well, this is the fourth definition of a word. I mean, maybe, um, but this is the only occurrence of that definition, which strikes me as a bit odd. But what I think is going on here is that the substance belongs to Christ. No. So these things were the shadows of what was to come. And what's the thing to come is the body of Christ. Christ in the flesh doing what? Being crucified. That's what all the Old Testament is about, is pointing towards the body of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Where the Lord, as I just spent a long time talking about, um, nailed all that stuff 
to the cross in Jesus. It was all pointing to him. Every feast, every new moon, every Sabbath, everything in the um, the tabernacle, all the kings, all the prophets, all the judges, all the people, all the things. Take the whole Old Testament, every act of salvation, everything, and it's all a shadow that the body of Christ on the cross is casting backward in time. It's all him, everything, him. And he that that's Paul's point here. That the body of Christ um, is the thing that's casting the shadow backwards. And that's what the feasts and the new moons and the Sabbaths are really all about. Not about, again, doing something right so you make God happy. It's all about Jesus for you. All right. Oh. Do not let anyone disqualify you. Ooh, that would not be good. You don't want to be uh, disqualified. Is that what that is? Yeah, to just to cheat you. Ooh, do not let anyone cheat you, disqualify you, wanting uh, in some sort of humility and um, worship of angels. Oh my. Um, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, the the mind of his flesh. So we've got the fleshly mind here at work. And what is the fleshly mind going to do? Disqualify you from this body of Christ. His cruci being crucified for you. Um, wanting you to operate in some sort of humility, asceticism, or worship of angels, or visions, or, or whatever anyone's sort of peddling. That isn't Jesus. That's what's going to cheat you out of Jesus. Um, it's that black or white. It's all about Jesus. Or it's it's about you. And if it's about you, well, then it should be about asceticism. Fasting. Um, giving up things. It could be about even you preparing. We're big on that uh, in the Lutheran church. I think so, when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Right? Got to prepare. Got to get ready. I mean, that's fine outward training, the catechism says. But it's about Christ. Faith in his words. He makes, he makes you prepared. In fact, his supper prepares you for eternal life. We're not going to worship angels. We don't, we don't care about visions. Uh, we're not trying to be led away by someone's fleshy mind. Things that the flesh will be after. But many people do. How many how many Christians are out there chasing after visions? Um, because that, that makes sense to us. What doesn't make sense to our flesh is Christ. The flesh doesn't want Christ. Um, certainly not his flesh and blood in the supper, but just not Christ. It doesn't no. It's um if we're gonna be in Paul elsewhere in First Corinthians. It is a um, stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to, to us, Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's everything. But all the other stuff puffs up and we go after it because that's what our flesh wants. Big powerful, big action, big asceticism. We want, um, we want to see people walk in the walk that we determine is the walk to walk. Um, and that's not to say there isn't um, fruit of the Spirit, um, but to focus on, on those things, the walk of the, the, which walk they're walking, their asceticism, what, what they're, they're looking after, angels or visions or messengers or what, well, that's just not going to get you anywhere. So let no one disqualify you who, uh, who, do, who does these things and who is not clinging to the head from whom all the body uh, through joints and ligaments is being uh, nourished and knitted together 
Yes, so they're clinging to other things and not the head, who is Christ, from whom we are his body, because we receive his body and his blood. Um, but we are nourished, we are fed, um, right here, nourished, fed, and also knitted together in the body of Christ, because it's his body that nourishes us, gives us the forgiveness of sins, um, and from it, as Luther um, in question, um, I think it's 18 in Christian questions with their answers, where it says, why, why do you want to go to the sacrament? So I would learn to love God and my neighbor. That's what the sacrament does for you. It's why we pray at the end that the sacrament would work um, on account of the forgiveness of sins, would work in us um, faith toward God and fervent love toward one another. And we are um, nourished and knit together in that body and that blood. Uh, because as Paul says, um, as many, as many, um, kernels of wheat have been brought together in the one bread so we who are many are one body so we've taken of the one body and then we can be, be knit together in the forgiveness of sins not not separated not chasing after other things on our own but truly one because the blood um, that we've received in the chalice I've received it with that other person of course we're knit together how can I not treat him that way or her that way she drank from the same chalice I did ate the same body I did, drank the same blood I did. We are one in that body and that blood, nourished. And then we grow, and here again, this is it, grows. Grows with a growth that is God's. God's the one who grows. He grows you. He grows us up together in the body of Jesus. We're united in him. He's the head. He grows it in us. We receive it as gift. We chase after it. We lose the gift. The chasing after it is just the asceticism, worship of angels, visions, whatever philosophy, uh, rules of life you can give me. Um, but in God, in the supper of his son's body and blood, where we are made one and we are united with his son, there the son grows in us and through us. And it's all gift. And there's no... Um, no fear of condemnation in that gift. Uh, we can be alive in that love that God has for us, in the giving of his son, nailing him and his rules to the cross and giving us, um, the son giving us his body and blood, sending us the spirit. It all works together. Um, it all works together there. The body of Christ is the, sh is the thing and it casts, its shadow backwards um, through all the, the Old Testament things that point forward to him. And, and he still casts his shadow by bringing that body to us so that we would be joined and united together, um, bone to bone, ligament to ligament, you and me. Whether you're, this is another Paul language, is doesn't matter if you're a hand or or I'm an eye, it doesn't matter. We're all one body because we are all of the one body, the body of Christ. Um, oh boy, I'm out of time. Well, I didn't have a time for plug because, again, I've got a mason jar. But there's merch. Merch is on sale. Um, so maybe Sandra or Erica or somebody will post the link here or just head over to um, higherthings.org, new website. Uh, and you can check out the, the, the store there and buy, um, buy the merch. Um, and with that, I'm going to finish up here, and you can join us back uh, tomorrow, um, same, same time, same place. Uh, it'll be Pastor Borkart tomorrow, um, and I believe um, I'll be back at this actually next week. I believe next Monday and Tuesday. I think Pastor, if I'm remembering Pastor Borkart's um, conversation. He and I talked about it. So I thank you for joining me. Um, hopefully it was helpful. The, the, the Spirit will bless um, all of you and me uh, through this study. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.